So I'm sorry, stand like this because it's too short the signal from the IR. So uh, first of all, yes, I, I work here, work with Peter Nectigal in the group, this is a teacher group. And my background is not really into much into chemistry, it's more in material science. I work most of my academic life on this thing here called Abbey Perspect. Uh, so the title is a kind of a, a trick, it's called Catalyst instead of Catalysis. That's because I'm talking a lot about materials and very little about actual catalytic effects or, uh, or let's say, catalytic mechanism. Um, so what I mean materials is that I've worked on batteries, I've worked on photovoltaics, and I underline here that most of my work involves the use of EFT. So this talk is quite difficult, it's quite complex, I would say. It's divided mostly into two parts. The first part is an introduction. In the introduction to material science and in general the use of computer and simulation for, uh, for chemistry, physics, whatever application. And then there is more DFT introduction uh, that could be useful also to people in biology or in chemistry. I will show to some extent some DFT methods for specific simulations. And then I move to application, which are mostly three classes of materials. Uh, I won't speak much about their catalytic properties as I mentioned, but they all can be used for catalysis because they are somehow related to surfaces. Uh, this, this talk is the result of many other talks or contributions I did mixed them together. And because of that, some of this part will you know, spill over into the other part, some extra details if needed. And so I start to introduce that I guess most of the people here are experimentalists, but they work in labs. I do not. Thankfully, um, and let's say that from a historical perspective, if you go like in the basic of science at the beginning, so from let's say Galileo or Hobbes or Newton, uh, you know, science was basically philosophy. It was a mixture of everything. Then over time, the development of um, of physical and mathematical methods, we started to develop two different branches. One was theory, where people were doing mathematical modeling, and and then there was experiments. Both of these sides are part of science. Both of these sides are uh, completely different expertise, or they need different things, right? Uh, I think um, nowadays I'd like to introduce simulation as a third branch of this type of diagram, because simulation didn't change in terms of quantity the use we can do of theory, but change qualitatively how we use theory. Specifically, you know, in the past theory was kind of uh, can be done on a piece of paper. When we started to do computational simulation, that changed radically the way we can treat the theories and how we can compare results. There are plenty of things to say uh, on this topic. It would be more brief now. I just point out two main aspects of this, uh, of this environment, let's say. The first one is the computer power. Uh, the computer power, more or less, grew up in an exponential fashion over time. And this is the top 500 supercomputer. It's a bit outdated, but the concept is the same. Uh, so over time, this is the sum of the top 500 supercomputer. This is the top number one. You can see it's a bit above the midpoint. And this is the, the, the last, the slowest computer. Uh, this is exponential scale. So this means that this computer power is doubling every 18 months in this, in this respect. <laughs> I'd like to point out that if you assume a discrete evolution of computer power, it means that every time you have a doubling, the computer time you have due to the exponential growth is larger than the sum of all the computer power in all the past history. This is a crucial point of exponential mechanism. Uh, because of this, they are so that uh, our mind basically is not uh, used to, to, to grasp this type of growth so fast. And that basically has a huge effect on how we do science. And in particular, the emergence of fields like big data, uh, or neural network, or artificial intelligence is something we have to learn to deal with. Uh, so, well, basically, bottom line is we have many computers that are powerful, we can do a lot of stuff with that. And we want to work a lot on material design. I want to convince you that the way we do science in the field of materials change radically with the introduction of computers. At the very beginning, uh, let's say we refer basically to the appearance of computers, or let's say mid, midway through the last century. Uh, 
there were some mechanical machines to do calculation, and people were able to study some specific cases. So we got some theory, for example, for diamond, or copper, or one atom in one cell type of system. And you could do some small software, which at the time was open, some mechanical, some objects that were mechanical moving, to solve this specific case. Nowadays, we went to a second step where basically with some restriction, but if you give me a material, some crystallographic information, I can predict to a good extent that their properties, and we can have nowadays software that are commercial available. The next step, if you're know, talking about, for example, material design, would be the opposite. I'd like to have a material which has some specific properties, and I can design it with a computer, and this is due only to the fact that we have an exponential increase in computer power and data visibility. So I'd like to call this an evolution, and we'll, this is a bit cringe, but it was a devolution of research. It's not just larger and stronger, it's intrinsically different way of working. And this is going to change the, basically the work of everyone in every field in the next two, three centuries. So now let's start with the boring part. Uh, no, George. So this is, uh, I want to start with some concept that I also developed recently teaching this topic. So, Everyone knows that the probability of the material depends mostly on the wave function. And if you want to solve the probability of the metallic system, you have the triangle equation, and that's extremely difficult. Uh, in, let's say in the chemistry world, people start to use the Atikov method, which is a linear combination of atomic orbitals. Uh, but in the 60s, some people realized that that's not really necessary. Many of the problems, in particular the energy, only depends on the density of of the electron density, so the amount of charge in the space. Um, and so this is called a mean field approach. And basically, yeah, with, with what is called density functional theory, we can calculate the energy of the system. So here I reported cafe, because we love coffee, I'm Italian, so I'm obliged to. This is just some uh, outer shell of the charge density, so some part of the charge. And we have no information about the wave function in principle. But you can see that here, we can see, for example, the carbon-oxygen bond, some polarization. You can see some sort of lone pair on the nitrogen, I think, I hope I'm not chemistry. Um, and you can see also how the bond between carbon are, are basically equivalent to the monopolar, while they are not in the case of nitrogen. So one caveat, I will speak more about this later on, uh, is that DFT is an exit theory. But we don't know all the details of DFT. In particular, we don't know the exchange correlation between electrons, so we use some different methods. Uh, so this is basically what, when you read the DFT paper, when people speak about LDA, DGA, it's not really important so far. But then, this is all about molecules. DFT has been developed mostly for crystalline system. So I'd like you to introduce you the concept of periodic boundary conditions. So when you work with a crystal, an ideal crystal is infinite, and what we are doing is basically using Moebius, a uh, ribbon, picture from Esther here. Um, and so we don't speak anymore about uh, the direct space. We speak about reciprocal space, we talk about orbitals, no, we speak about bands, right? Uh, and if you want to project back on the real space, so in the direct space, we can still think in terms of molecular orbitals. There's some sort of uh, force in this concept in, in, the, in the answer we are assuming. Uh, I just want to point out this very clearly because most of the concepts in my talk will refer to this type of DFT, not to the molecular DFT, especially when we speak about magnetic properties. And so <coughs> now we start, this is the last part of the introduction. Uh, yeah, I mentioned that DFT can calculate the energy, you can calculate properties, we have computers, we do material design, and so on and so forth. Um, DFT does not contain temperature, it's not zero Kelvin. Okay? It's, there is no temp. Temperature doesn't exist. In the amazing world of DFT, temperature is not a thing. It's not about, for example, one issue is that you don't have zero point vibrational energy. Uh, but we are interested in temperature and in time, in the evolution. So you know there is something called molecular dynamics, which means that if you have some particles and you know how the particle interacts, which means which force is regulate, uh, which force the, uh, which force is binding this particle according to their position, for example, the energy potential that everyone knows. Well, if you know that, you can know how the system evolves over time. You can see you have the force, you can calculate the speed of particles, and then you can calculate the new position. And you create a set of snapshots that tell you the story. So in principle, 
this is also doable if you do that with DFT. DFT is able to calculate the forces. And when you do that with DFT, it's called ab initial molecular dynamics because you don't have any more a classical model. It's not a simple trivial dependence on the position or the distance between atoms or the angle. It's a quantum mechanical issue. Uh, so you can have better descriptions of this process. And you can use different level of theory to describe the forces between the system. On the other end, it's much more expensive, and you are restricted to basically the amount of time you can simulate or the size of the system you can have. Um, this is something underlying this idea. Everything here, and this is really important, is not the result of DFT or computation or anything. Uh, when you do molecular dynamics, you are basically forcing some statistical methods, which is a Boltzmann distribution, and you're using that mathematical bit to uh, use the, the quantity from DFT in that mathematical frame of reference to obtain some quantity that you hope relates to the world. So remember, the temperature doesn't exist in any simulation. Temperature arises only from the Boltzmann component of, you know, of the statistics. So after this very introduction about uh, munition D, the next step is about magnetic properties. So when you speak about magnetic properties, you think about the iron, for example, D orbitals, and you know that the magnetic properties depends on the number of unpaired electrons. Uh, this doesn't make sense in plane waves because it's more complex than this. But when we calculate that, the important bits are the following one. When we talk about the magnetic aspect, we have to take into account that you can have scalar magnetic properties. So basically, you can decide if one ion is up or down. You can have not collinear magnetics, so it's more complex. You don't only say that it's up or down, you also say this is a vector and points in one point in space, and then you can have more sophisticated things. Uh, to calculate these properties with DFT, we need to speak a level of theory, and I'll speak later on about this topic. Here, just represent a picture of two materials that undergo space transition, and you can see blue and yellow represent two different uh, scalar spin, and when you have a basically a deformation of the system, you get a change in the orienting on the orientation of the ions. Last bit of introduction about the method is NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, I'd like to speak a lot about nuclear physics, but I think I can not, or I should not. Uh, so basically, some nuclei are formed by fermions, and so which is neutron and protons. Such elemental particles have a spin, and you can combine them in different ways. But when you combine electrons, which are also fermions, you have some sort of restriction. Why? The rules for nuclei is completely different. So some nuclei will have a different from zero spin, some they will not. The point is that without the presence of a magnetic field, all the possible configurations uh, are basically uh, equivalent. The moment you turn on an external magnetic field, you start to create some energy split. So, it's more complicated than this scheme, but this is just the idea of it, right? And so now, from the two degenerate state, you've got two different states which magnetic properties are, the, 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 are separated by energy. And this energy for typical uh, fields in the order of the tens of Tesla is in the order of the micro electron volts or the radio frequency. And then what happens is basically that if you send the radio wave frequency, if the frequency is right, they will be absorbed by the nuclei, and then you see your signal. This division depends mostly on the type of nuclei. But if you are a nuclei in a compound, in a crystal, the presence of other nuclei, the presence of other electrons, slightly change this type of, of, uh, of energy division. And it changes this type of division in the order of the million part, so one ppm, one part per million. Uh, and so what we are doing is, when we measure this, this response to a radio frequency, uh, we have some reference, and we see how this reference is shift by one million, and we decide that that shift corresponds to a specific geometric property. Uh, when we do that with DFT, this is a bit technical. Uh, historically, if you want to calculate the molecule's uh, response to NMR, you can do that with the molecule. If you pick a molecule, you do that. When, you, when people start to calculate crystal, the way they did it was to create a cluster. They take a piece of material, they cut it, they terminated the surface to keep electrons happy. Uh, but nowadays, we can use other methods that developed roughly 20 years ago, uh, that's 17, 18, 
uh, where we use plane waves, uh, something called GFO, total potential. I won't go too much into details. But basically, we can calculate the NMR magnetic response for infinite crystalline system, and this allows us to take into account long range interactions that are happening in, in cluster. And we can also simulate more complex systems, such as alloys, disordered system defects, uh, and impurities. This is the work done by Chen that probably is not happy that the picture is here. And now we start with the result. The first one is about zeolite. I'm not sure how much people know about zeolite, probably more than I do. So they are minerals, they are microporous minerals, and yeah, they are catalytic, they can be used for catalytic application because they have a lot of surface, they have a lot of defects, and they can basically speed up some reaction or make some reaction happen. Um, we, we will speak mostly about one specific zeolite, which is chalazite. Um, yeah, as you might can assume, everyone knows that they are a network of silicon oxide, but they are often called alumino silicate, silicates because silicon can be replaced by aluminum. And this makes the system a bit more complex. We have to introduce other methods to balance the charge. And we can also have the presence of water or, in principle, other impurities. Our specific model is Shabazite. This is the conventional cell of Shabazite. Uh, you cannot appreciate that in the colors, but in this specific compound, there are 30 to 36 atoms of silicon, and then one, which is this one, called slightly different, is replaced by aluminum. Aluminum is a different balance, so the charge is compensated by the presence of a sodium ion, which is the yellow ball and then everything contains some water molecules, right? And we wanted to, in the many, the many calculations we have done, we assume present a different number of molecules of water, and with DFT, we first we optimize the geometry, which means we found the coordinate system, or the position of the atoms where the energy was minimum. But then we realized that this is not a good representation of the atom, because we didn't take into account temperature, because it's DFT, and because water, you know, water is quite, mobile in principle. Um, so from that point, we develop an ab initio molecular dynamic simulation, which means we start making things moving around a specific temperature of 300 Kelvin. And that basically creates a snapshot series, right? So molecular dynamic simulation is out the trajectory, which is, you know, it's like a movie. So for some of these frames, we calculate the NMR response. So I'll show you the initial result. Uh, so, in the same molecule before, we decided to keep track of the distance between sodium and aluminum. Sodium and aluminum are uh, interacting. So, if you have zero water or one molecule of water, as you can expect, sodium wants to get very close to aluminum, right? You want to minimize the charge separation. Uh, it's a bit more complex. Actually, sodium likes to sit <coughs> on one of the uh, windows of the Shabazite network. So, you want to interact a bit with the oxygen of the frame and also with aluminum. And this is very important because if you are looking in, in terms, for example, of the activity of the aluminum site, knowing where the countercalcium sits could be very important. But it's also important because usually you don't have a perfect vacuum, you have other things in your system. And so the question is, is sodium and aluminum so bound that they always stay together or they move around over time if the temperature conditions are, uh, are appropriate? So when you put just one molecule of water, this is the case. This is the distance, it's roughly 3 point something ohms from. Uh, you can see that basically over time there's a bit of oscillation, but the distance doesn't change much. When we increase the number of waters, actually we see the distance have to be different. So we still have a, a majority uh, distance of roughly a bit longer distance of 3. This is the green part. But sometimes the water gets in between the aluminum and the sodium, and basically the distance increases. So this idea was, well, actually, we kind of hypothesized, hypothesized from our simulation that yeah, if you put enough water, the, the sodium gets detached from, from the framework. So it would be nice if we can see that in the NMR simulation. So water moves around, sodium moves around. Both sodium and aluminum are active species. So, well, we expect that if you take a structure from here, the signal will be different from this one. So that's what we did. We take roughly 1,000 structure. But what we figured out so far is there is no correlation. At least there is no trivial correlation. The distance between sodium and aluminum doesn't really change the chemical shielding, which is the shift 
of the energetic level we spoke before. This means many, many things. It can mean that there is no correlation at all. It means the correlation is more complex than we expect. Or it means that we are making an error of 